All right, we're going to go ahead and get started on the next panel. I'm happy to introduce today Professor Jesse Hill, who will moderate our next panel on success stories about achieving diversity. Professor Hill currently serves as Associate Dean for Faculty and Development at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Ms. Hill joined the faculty in 2003 after practicing First Amendment and Civil Rights Law with the firm of Berkman, Gordon, Murray, and Devan in Cleveland. Before entering private practice, Ms. Hill worked at the Reproductive Freedom Project of the National ACLU Office in New York, litigating challenges to state law restrictions on reproductive rights. She also served as law clerk to the Honorable Karen Nelson Moore of the United States Courts of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Ms. Hill earned a BA from Brown University and her JD from Harvard. Welcome. Um, wonderful. Well, um, so we're, I'm, I'm personally delighted um, to be here. And I know you've already heard from the two panelists, um, Laura Quitella and David Kurtz, that, uh, that I'm going to be moderating a discussion between. So I won't go through the introductions again. Um, I'll just say that I'm so, as, as a member of the faculty at this law school, I'm just, I've just been so impressed and just floored today by the, um, the alumni that we have gathered here in one place and how um, incredibly accomplished they are. Um, I'm really humbled uh, to be here. Um, so this session is going to be, as I said, we've both had a chance to hear some from these two uh, speakers. So this session is going to be a little bit of a deviation from this format. We're trying to go for a more um, informal discussion style. Um, uh, I was told that I would be playing a sort of Katie Couric role. Um, uh, I'm going to be asking the questions, which I guess is why the brownies are on my table. Um, uh, and, and really touch on some topics that, you know, that, that have already been touched on, but maybe we can go a little bit deeper um, into depth about. Um, hear some personal stories uh, uh, involving diversity in the context of achieving uh, strategic objectives in the business setting. And also, you know, if I understand my Katie Couric role uh, properly, maybe to challenge some of our conceptions uh, about the role of diversity while still smiling and, and looking nice. So um, <laughs> uh, um, let me, um, so, so let me just start off this uh, session by making the observation that Laura told us this morning, she comes from uh, a company, Kodak, that has been extremely progressive in terms of gender equity, uh, uh, gender diversity policies supporting gender diversity. David comes from a setting, um, big law firms and uh, the world of, of finance, M&A, um, corporate restructuring, and so on, that is um, arguably just sort of in the process of, of diversifying. Um, still, uh, still very much maybe in the early stages of that and, and starting to bring women's voices to the table. So um, if I can start with putting the spotlight maybe on David, um, I'll ask, you know, are there, are there really meaningful opportunities for women in the world of corporate law and finance? And if so, what needs to be done both um, by women but also by um, uh, large firms to uh, accommodate that or to make that happen? Well, the, <clears throat> the answer is an absolute yes. And so I'll just kind of uh, speak off the top of my head as to you know, how I would go about you know, thinking about developing the answer to that question. First, I, I think at, at Lazard and certainly at Skadden, you heard all about Skadden from, uh, from Peggy, and I think most large firms fall into that category. Um, and maybe this is the, um, you know, sort of the ultimate measure of success in some respects. But we never think, I never think, this is a male candidate, this is a female candidate. I just don't do it. I mean, it's just not in my mindset anymore. Just like I never think, you know, this is a female CFO or a male CFO or a female, you know, we're, I think we're past that. And um, I think that that's the first step. Um, Certainly in, in the investment banking world, more than the law firm, um, I mean, if you discount noses, many more men than women. Um, so as a, as a theoretical matter, you know, we would love to find ways to promote the careers of women. Um, if for no other reason, as I mentioned earlier this morning, it's just good business. I mean, it's, you know, you, I mean, it's the right thing to do and all of that, <coughs> but 
it's nice when the right thing to do coincides with the financial bottom line. And here it, it really does. You know, unless you can feel the diverse team, then you're really at a competitive disadvantage. And, um, you know, I don't really know why um, the, the imbalance is still more pronounced in the investment bank than the law firm. I don't know if it's a matter of, um, you know, women being less inclined to enter financial careers. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the law firm workload is, is challenging, but I'll tell you in the investment bank, the life of our young analysts is just absolutely miserable. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I mean, it's beyond miserable. Right. I, I don't know how they do it, but the, you know, the, the typical work day ends at midnight and, you know, then they go out for three or four hours and then they start all over again the next day. <laughs> um, and, you know, you have to be a special kind of person to, you know, want to put yourself through that. Um, and, you know, that, that just is the job requirement. I mean, in, in many respects, yeah. it's th the job doesn't begin until the day ends because, mm -hmm. you know, what we do is we take all of the stuff of the day and then we dump it on the young analysts to, all right, mm -hmm. here's what needs to be, here's the model that needs to be updated, here's the analysis that needs to be run. And so it's a very difficult, um, you know, road to start from the bottom and, and work your way up. And, um, you know, we, we have had... Um, you know, a number of women start and just, you know, I, who did very well. And I think for lifestyle reasons, you know, more than some of the guys, although to be sure we've lost many, it's not like we only lose women for lifestyle. There are a lot of males who come in and say, I've had it, this mm -hmm. just sucks. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. do this anymore. <laughs> um, so it's not just a, you know, a, a female phenomenon, but you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's something that, um, you know, has certainly has not developed as rapidly yeah. and it's, I don't know how you, other than knowing that you want it to be successful, I think, um, and sort of treasuring these opportunities where we do find women who are prepared to, you know, make the self-sacrifice associated with these jobs. You know, we want them to succeed, but, you know, I, I don't, it's, it's the same job for both. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, thus far, uh, the dropout rate um, among women has just been higher. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's something we struggle with. Do you want to? Sure. Yeah, I, wanna, I, um, I actually have been thinking most of the morning about the acute error I made. I was in the role of hiring reserve for Kodak when we were um, when we were considering filing bankruptcy and we were looking at our options. And I can't think, and I, this dawned on me today. I can't think of a situation um, over the past several years, probably four or five years, when I haven't begun a conversation with a law firm. Oh, sorry, thanks. When I haven't begun a conversation with a law firm by um, talking about what the, the the team that I'm hiring will look like and how it will be comprised. And I mentioned that this morning on litigation matters, but we do that really across the board. When you're in, and David is the, the chair of the restructuring uh, practice for Lazard, when you, when a company is entering um, really, you know, nearing the abyss and descending into the darkness of bankruptcy, you, I didn't, and I think most clients don't, stop to say, well, let's talk about what the team's going to look like, David, and, and really how many, you know, what, how many at this year and that year and how many women and men. And I actually should have done that. And I will say that since, and I'm sure Dave, this will resonate with David, since we've been in the bankruptcy process, there have been moments when I wish that I had a female counterpart on the Lazard team to really work with and commiserate with and, you know, cry on her shoulder. And, you know, there's just a, a different kind of communication that goes on. So I fault myself for not having um, sort of applied the same discipline to this recruitment. I still would have hired Lazard, and we're fabulous that, that we are partnered with Lazard, but I probably would have had a, a longer conversation with David's predecessor about what will the team look like. Perhaps you don't have the same client pull in your practice that, that the law firms do outside of this, this practice area where we, we really aren't moving at such a pace and making really painful decisions so quickly and not having much of a chance to step back. I don't know. Well, I think that in our business, um, you know, it's kind of the restructuring. It's mm -hmm. the ultimate crisis right. business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in a, in a weird way, there's uh, uh, to the point you just made. The normal rules many don't times apply. don't apply. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, we're desperate. I mean, nobody um, reaches the conclusion that they need to hire a bankruptcy advisor lightly. So it's always after, you know, all other alternatives have been exhausted and even... 
at that point, you know, hope springs eternal. But you know, it's a, it's a relative. It's We're a. Still in there. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's it's a relatively small unit. I mean, it's competitive, mm -hmm. but competitive within a very small universe. And um, you know, if you, I mean, look at our firm, and I think about our competitors, and uh, you know, we just do a very poor job of of diversity. Mm -hmm. And so I I think that it's. Um, and maybe if there were more, if it was a more normal, you know, hiring um, yeah. relationship, mm -hmm. you know, it would it would be something that would be, um, you know, more of an acute issue for us. Um, but it, and I, and, yeah. I mean, we do have one, you know, female partner, and um, <laughs> for, <laughs> at least the last time I checked, you know, she hasn't, <laughs> she hasn't left yet. So, uh, <laughs> well, we've tethered her to her office, so she can never leave. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah, I think there's something about the, um, you know, the, uh -huh. the crisis dynamic in our business that, you know, makes a lot of these considerations that apply elsewhere not all that relevant. So, right. So that's, re that's really interesting. And I, I, I do want to come back to a couple of um, points that, that you made earlier, uh, David. But before I do, I'd like to just ask Laura a follow-up because that, uh, that, that was actually something else that I was going to ask because you, you had mentioned earlier that you'd like to ensure the diversity of, of yeah. um, the teams that you work with and um, that this is something that you really value. And I was wondering, you know, if you could give an example. So you just mentioned that, you know, there was this case where you didn't insure it and you were sorry. Uh, but can you say a little bit more about why you, I mean, aside from the fact that you think it's important, was there a moment where you thought, oh, this would have gone differently? Or, you know, if I, you said if I had a female counterpart on the other side, maybe. Um. I, I don't think the progression of the bankruptcy or the way that Lazard has addressed the project or delivered the results would be different. But I do think the dynamics might be different. And David speaks of these hours, and of course, any bankruptcy case, uh, in any bankruptcy case, almost everybody works those hours on both right. sides of the table, mm -hmm. or you know, in partnership with each other. And so there have been lots of long nights and multiple meetings. You know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And and I, as I said, it was pretty simple to have had more um, colleagues, female colleagues, that I could have commiserated with through the really painful process would probably have made me feel different about the process to mm -hmm. some extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, But I, I don't think the outcome would be different. I, although right. I spent a lot of time preaching this morning about the power of diverse teams and the financial right. performance delivered by women, so who knows? It's but just very hard to measure, I think, yeah. probably. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, the, the work-life balance piece of it is, is, is a tough one, I agree, because I think it's fair, you know, we, we can all accept the idea that there are some jobs that, like you said, it's just the nature of the job. You just have to be on call 24 seven for right. your clients. And, um, you know, you, you can say you're go, you know, I, I don't know if anyone even does um, in investment banks, but, you know, go down to 80% and say, I'm not gonna work one day a week or something. No, it doesn't even, but you know, that, that is the classic story. No, and, that is right? a law firm thing. That's a law firm that thing, does right? does not exist in the investment bank. Yeah, but even then it often doesn't play out very right. well, right? It doesn't end up actually Sounds happening. Sounds better in theory. Right, right. Um, so I wonder, you know, for, from the perspective of working sort of within that world, there's not a lot you can do in the moment or even, you know, over a short term to really change that, I think. But, you know, is it possible to change it long term in the next generation, over time? What would need to happen? Or is it just inevitable, do you think? I mean, is it possible to change the structures that, or, or the way people think? such that that is not the barrier that it is now, I wonder. Well, I think that, you know, we, um, you know, we're a small enough firm that uh, we, um, we have the ability to be flexible. You know, we don't have thousands of employees where, you know, you really need to kind of have rules about these things in order to be fair. And, um, uh, I mean, hard in the initial stages to, well, you know, you don't have to, you can go home at 10. I mean, that just doesn't work. Everybody else stays till 12. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it's something that it's in, that's important enough to us and that, you know, we, we very much want to make work that, um, look, I, I hope we have our biggest problem is that we haven't had the opportunities because the women who have joined our group, by the time, you know, they never get to a level of seniority where we could kind of, you know, be a little flexible on, um, you know, how to structure uh, a work-life balance and I mean one thing about investment banking is you're not billing hours and so in many respects I mean that's easier I mean, you can work from anywhere nobody really cares um, but boy we have um, 
and I don't think it's unique to our firm. Mm -hmm. I think it's true of investment banking across the board. You know, the, the dropout rate is, is very high. So I, I think I speak accurately for Lazard when I say it, it's something we, we care about a lot, something we think about a lot, something that we haven't had a lot of success in, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, you know, we keep kind of scratching our heads as to how to make it work better. And um, I, I don't think we've, we've come up with the right formula yet. Well, and I'm not sure it's the kind of thing that one firm can really do, right? I mean, maybe that's, that's part of the problem is that you can't suddenly change clients' expectations and, you know, how the investment banking world works on your own, right? Unilaterally, it's kind of a The job a is the job. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very tough job. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't. Everybody works hard. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as though you reach a certain level and then you can go part time. But in those early years, you know, it's a very difficult job, and I think it just, um, uh, you know, a lot of people just say this isn't for me. I'm not mm -hmm. prepared to make that kind of sacrifice. To, um, and also, you know, it's an, I mean, even law firms now. Um, you know, when Peggy joined, she was saying it was sort of expected. All right, you put in your time, at least you know you're going to make partner. Well, that's no longer the case in the law firm, and it's especially not the case in the investment bank. There's just no guarantee mm -hmm. of anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really difficult proposition mm -hmm. that, you know, here, come on in, kill yourself. Um, you have to give up a lot of your personal life in order to make this work, and there are no guarantees mm -hmm. that it will have a happy ending mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people walk away. So mm -hmm. I, I you know, we're hopefully, you know, we'll do this again in 10 years and we'll be able to point to, you know, 10 years ago it looked like this and look how much progress we've made. But, you know, we have not made as much progress nearly enough as, as we would have wanted to. We're doing this next year. One year. Your calendar no, ten now. Years. That's so <laughs> right. Forget about 10 years. Um, you know, I think, David, I have to commend you because if you go back to the, to the McKinsey 13 measures of um, advancing a, a successful diversity program, the, f the first and most prominent measure is uh, commitment at the top. And so I hope that you're telling the story when you go back about how you spent your day today. Because I think the women in your firm would take a they lot. They won't believe it. Well, uh, and I'll <laughs> vouch for you. I will vouch for you. I think the women in your firm would be very heartened to know that you've devoted uh, the day with us today from, you know, I know how incredibly busy your practice is. Um, and your life is. So I think that's, that's step one. Um, step two, uh, which doesn't go to the work-life issues, and I realize that they're almost insurmountable in your environment, but step two is investing in the development of women. And I think that's something that Lazard, um, I'm sure, is already doing, but could do more of. And again, mm -hmm. it sends the signal of, well, I may, I may have a terrible work-life balance to start, but the firm's willing to invest in me, so that's the trade-off I can right. live with. So that's, I think that's, um, that's step two. And then these other things that are more difficult in your environment, you, you, we all can't do it all. I mean, Kodak, Kodak began this incredible diversity commitment probably 25 years ago. There was a woman in the company in middle management named Jane Lampier who was um, just the consummate role model and mentor and ultimately sponsor. She passed away prematurely of brain cancer and an award was developed in her memory which is a very coveted award at Kodak um, given to any a man or woman who um, is committed to advancing diversity. And from that sprang these, a very comprehensive um, commitment to diversity on the company's part. So that when I showed up in 1999, um, diversity was already part of the fabric of the company. It wasn't something that was talked about at a special forum. It wasn't given special attention. But we were surrounded with um, initiatives and the inculcation of initiatives that had been launched in service of diversity. So I come from a very, I, I have been, I've been, I've had the honor and privilege to serve in a very different environment from the one David faces. But it, it began in a very heavy industrial environment. Right. I'm sure there was someone like you at that point saying, you know, this is really hard. We can't, we don't know where to begin. But I think you already have begun. That's the good news. Well, I think just being conscious of yeah. mm -hmm. the Absolutely. situation is, the beginning and um, you know the interesting um, you know, how things kind of shift but in the way you think about it you know they the ultimate mark of success in any professional services firm but more in investment banking um, than in law at the senior most levels is business generation so um, 
you know, one of the things you think about is, well, and, and nobody succeeds at the senior levels unless you can bring in business and everyone's given, you know, kind of an amount of time and the fact that you get promoted to managing director, there's no such thing as tenure mm -hmm. in the investment bank. Um, Only I have that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the, so the, the twist on this is that I think actually we're, there are untapped business generation opportunities that we would be able to take advantage of if we had a woman in a senior role. I agree. You know, because, mm -hmm, I, I mean, I, I was just thinking, you know, on my way over here today, how many of my clients are, are you know, every major situation I'm involved in, there is a female senior executive now, or a general counsel, chief financial officer, you know, I mean, every single one. And um, I think there's a huge opportunity for, um, you know, women to generate business and to be successful. So the, the weird thing is, you, you know, you, you have the kind of the, you know, your prototype 25-year-old male mm -hmm. who's willing to work forever, and they do mm -hmm. a great job analytically, but you wonder, can they ever generate business? And then almost the opposite, where the women maybe are not as willing to put in the time, yeah. you know, at the lower levels, but if we could ever get them up into the senior ranks, I think they would be very well positioned to be successful huh. in the way that success is defined, you know, when you get to the more, you know, senior role. Right, that's really interesting. Um, I, I want to touch on another theme that you raised, David, about uh, sort of, you mentioned it briefly, but that, you know, the women are sort of underrepresented in finance-related careers in general, and, and one thing that uh, really struck me with some of the conversation this morning was um, how many women, I think, on, on the um, first three-person panel, uh, people said that, oh, well, you know, I came very late to finance. I sort of, you know, realized that I needed this. I kind of taught it to myself or someone sat down with me. They didn't really come with formalized training. And uh, Laura, I know this is something you had mentioned before as well. And, you know, is that still the case? And is that starting to change? Are women starting to um, uh, come in with this background? Or do you think there's still not a, um, you know, n not an awareness that this is important? Well, we were having this discussion at lunch. I don't know where the students are who were at our table, but um, we uh, generally the question was posed: Look, I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. I'm finishing my law school education in order to go on and get my MBA. That's another big commitment. Is it really worth it? Am I going to find a job that's going to value this investment that I've made in myself? Mm -hmm. um, I still continue. I, I continue to believe that yes, um, it's the right thing to do if you aspire to a career that um, requires an understanding of um, finance. Um, but I, I think that the, the pressure now, um, Jesse, is very much the economics of the environment. Um, mm -hmm. I think people realize better today the uh, value of the combination of degrees, but the problem is how to afford it. And then worrying about coming out and finding a paying job versus an internship or so it's really a mm -hmm. tough call to make mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, when I came out of law school, we all got jobs. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's just not the case now, and it would have been not at all difficult for me to um, take on another couple of years of debt because I'd be able to pay it back. But that's mm -hmm. a big question in people's minds today. Yeah. So. I, uh, on the other hand, to be in law school, I mean, maybe if somebody just tells you when you're in law school, you know, you should do this, mm -hmm. you can take a course, right? You can Absolutely. go over to the business school or you can go I'm, online or, you know, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be, is I that I think your? because I missed the opportunity, I'm a, yeah. I'm a big advocate of you can get it many, many other ways. And David mm -hmm. mentioned some additional ways on top of the list I gave this morning. Um, yeah, this is, this is about realizing um, the value of the skill and acquiring it however you go about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. The students were remarking that they don't feel that um, people in law school are reading the Wall Street Journal, which David had said, you know, that's a really easy way to get started. And if that's not happening in this day and age, wow, coming out with a professional mm -hmm. degree and not understanding the, at least the front page and the dynamics right. there and what's going on and what's important, that's, that's right. not a good right. recipe for right. success. Right, and with so much right, um, pushback you know, that we're seeing from firms at least saying, you know, we want your, uh, your graduates to come more ready right, right. to go right, right into practice. We don't want to have to spend a year sort of teaching them how to be lawyers. Right. Um, I think that's right. That's another component of it that we also need to be aware of. Yeah. I really um, commend Peggy's training program. I, I happen to have been in the hallways during the training um, of, I think, 2011. 
and the buzz and the enthusiasm. And uh, you could just tell that the, the folks there understood the value of what they were getting from the firm and the contribution the firm was making um, towards that. And that, that's just a fabulous opportunity for somebody coming out of law school. Mm -hmm. so. That's great. Um, Oh, so I have so many things I could, that I could focus on, so many things to ask. Um, do you ever think that, um, uh, well, and, and maybe some of David's comments actually went to this, but the sort of, the, the notion of the goals of diversity and um, other goals of the uh, institution are ever in um, tension at all. And I was thinking more, you know, are there ever contexts where maybe the client's wishes pull in a different direction? Or, you know, are international contexts, for example, any different from U.S. contexts and so on? Or is it pretty much a, more of a win-win these days um, to have a diverse team? Can I tell a story? Yeah. So um, in this, during this period of IP monetization that I've referenced, um, I negotiated with every major uh, Asian company in the consumer electronics segment. And, um, it, we started in Japan, and so over the course of about three years, we signed major license deals with virtually all the consumer electronics players. Um, during this period, we were also negotiating for rights ourselves to enter the printing market. Um, and uh, we had simultaneous negotiations going on with a number of companies. And with one in particular, we were about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through the discussion, and um, our CEO, Antonio Perez, got a phone call from the, his counterpart who said, we're coming to Rochester, we have an important issue to discuss. And, um, and we only want to talk to you. So in they came on a Friday evening. It was just the oddest dynamic for a Japanese, very odd behavior for a Japanese company. And so afterwards, Antonio called me and said, and David would appreciate this, I don't even know where to begin this conversation with you. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, well, they came to tell me that they can't um, actually do a deal with a female lead negotiator. And, um, and I absolutely, as you know, we know Antonio so well, I absolutely support you. I won't accept this. If we have to walk away and not get the rights from that company, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. And you know, it didn't, he's such an amazing um, person to work for and such an amazing mentor. It didn't take me a second to say, look, the company needs this and I'm happy to step aside because I was in an environment where I was entirely supported. It wasn't um, a reflection on me. He was very clear that he didn't really accept his behavior and was actually embarrassed by it. But it was the right thing to do. And we went on to get the rights and I've never purchased a product from that company. <laughs> <laughs> never will again. In contrast, and I'll name the other company, in contrast, at about the same period we were negotiating with Sony and um, Antonio went to see his counterpart. We typically began these discussions, you know, before we set, pay us several hundred million dollars. Um, we would try to launch a kind of a collaborative discussion. And so when the then Japanese um, CEO of Sony said, so who's your lead negotiator? What's his name? Antonio said, me. Um, he said, give me a few days. And the following Monday, he had, uh, by the following Monday, he had elevated a woman in the M&A group to this much higher position in the company and given her authority and um, the role to negotiate and conclude this agreement with Kodak, she and I became very good friends. We remain very good friends. In fact, the day we filed bankruptcy, she was the first person to call to say, you know, sorry that it's come to this. Um, but I, was always, I always felt really good about the fact that, that Sony kind of took a step back and said, okay, we're gonna match this um, <laughs> play by play and, wow. you know, had the wisdom to do that. So I buy lots of Sony products. <laughs> <laughs> And you should. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Have you had any um, observations? In no, the actually, I <clears throat> just listening to uh, Laura's story, I, I think it's so, you know, um, it's just an educational experience yeah. for me to learn that things like that still happen. I mean, I, I, yeah. if you asked me, you know, could this happen today? I would say no. There's, this couldn't. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's. I think mm -hmm. there's still a, um, you know, uh, well, I think some of us, uh, you know, who've been around a long time, who think everything is, you know, we've solved all the problems, the world is now equal, not so much, mm -hmm. you know, not quite as simple as we might think it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was really surprised to, uh, about the portion in your presentation when you, you were talking about 
measures that European uh, companies have taken and also that some governments have mandated quotas on right. boards and exec committees and so, or boards, more, I guess. More than not. Yeah, yeah, which would would seem really ham-handed here, I think, right, and if right. not illegal, right, right. <laughs> here, or unconstitutional <laughs> or something yeah. for the government. To, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so maybe one final um, set of questions, and then I think maybe we might want to open it up if, if folks want to follow up on anything from the audience. Um, so I wonder, um, kind of just generally how much of this falls under the category of culture within a firm uh, or a, a company. Um, and, you know, both from Laura's perspective, what really, and I don't know, I mean, you mentioned that you came into the into Kodak at a time when it was already sort of had accomplished the bulk of the change, I guess. And so maybe you, but maybe you have some thoughts about what sort of creates a culture of change or acceptance. You had mentioned, for example, leadership um, supporting that. Um, uh, you know, and then from the other side, of course, we talked about the work-life issues, but, you know, whether there's there are cultural issues that prevent diversity, you know, in, in other settings. And um, and I, I in this connection, I also just want to say I was really struck by the story you told, Laura, during your talk um, about the, um, the Mr. Lee, I think, Brian Lee, was it? Oh, Bill Lee. Bill Lee, mm -hmm. sorry, who, um, who gives the test and, and you know, grades the test and sees who scores the highest and which groups and also measures the confidence and that there was this confidence disparity, right? And it made me wonder, it's well, my do... Zen phone. Sorry. Oh. My Zen phone rings. Do, do, do men or male groups need to... Uh, or do women need to be more confident or do men need to be less confident, maybe, within <laughs> these cultures, right? Um, so, you know, what, what role does that play? You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because I meant to mention it earlier and I forgot. Um, you know, confidence is really important. If you don't have self-confidence, then you are dead on arrival, right? Because how mm -hmm. can anyone have confidence in you if you don't have confidence in yourself? And, um, and sometimes it's important to um, pretend that you're confident, <laughs> even, <laughs> even when you're not. Because <clears throat> when people... When you act as though you're, um, you're confident, you're comfortable in your advice, you're comfortable with the situation, um, you know, people respond to that in a, in, a, in a positive way. And it really is possible to kind of, you know, establish your own rules of engagement by how you present yourself. Number two, what I, what I find, and maybe, you know, here's a little woman thing, I, I, I think that, um, that women are, um, you know, you hate to generalize, right, because you can never generalize, but I will generalize I for a moment that, um, you know, women are very hard on themselves, it seems, and they don't mm -hmm. know how much they know, or they don't know That's that what, what I mean. they don't know is actually less than somebody else's don't know, and so they emphasize what they don't know rather than what they do, and it's very self-defeating, very self-defeating. And um, look, I see, talk about your daughter. I see this with my daughter all the time. And you know, I, my son is, he's, he knows everything and he'll go in and get a C. You know, my daughter, <laughs> I, you know, I've, I don't know anything and she'll get a 96. And it's just, it's so, so different in approach. Um, and so I think that confidence is really important and it's, it's important to have it. And it's important if you have it to make sure you display it. And, Frankly, it's important to display it even if you don't have it. At the same time, I wonder <laughs> if, so, and I agree, I, I mean, you know, from what I can tell, I don't, I'm no expert, but the, all of that makes um, a lot of sense to me. Um, but I wonder if there isn't um, some value or some of what makes women um, strong, good leaders or, or people you know, if one advantage women might not have, might have is some of that, um, that little bit, when it's not too exaggerated, a little bit of that humility that sort of makes you say, you know, maybe I need to listen a little more, or maybe I need to um, ask more questions before I make a decision or get more input. I don't know. This is my speculation, but maybe you can tell me whether my in intuition is right or not. I do. I don't know if this is a 
a true difference between women and men. But I do notice more frequently that women enjoy promoting the accomplishments of others and showcasing mm -hmm. those, probably ahead of their own. I have to say, I'm going to commend Peggy again, because I was kind of worried as you were talking that you wouldn't get to the accomplishments that you've achieved at Skadnarps. And I was really delighted when you, in a very humble way, mentioned that you might have had a little success. Um, <laughs> because clearly, <laughs> clearly, Peggy, you've been a role model and a leader um, in your career. And we should all um, be applauding that. And we should have the benefit of knowing about it. So I'm glad that you touched on it. Um, I don't think that we do know comfortably how to talk about ourselves. Um, and I completely agree with uh, what David said. My daughter was here last year when I was visiting the school and Dean Mitchell was kind enough to hook her up with the admissions office and she went on a little tour and did the thing and came back at the end of the day and I said, so, you know, how did it go? And she's very interested in a combined medical program. And she said, well, mom, you know, I, there are just so many qualified candidates and I, I don't know, I don't know if I could even qualify for a second round of interviews. My son's here today, and um, he texted me a little while ago. He said, they loved me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's Typical. so true. It is. <laughs> <laughs> we, right. before. we have the same pattern in our household. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, well, th this yeah. has been wonderful, and such a wonderful set of insights. Before I open it up you know, to questions from the audience, I just want to thank you so much. And, and especially, David, for being such a good sport, because uh, it's Absolutely. an awkward position to put you in, I realized. Well, when well. else do I get it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and my only regret, really, is that I, I didn't find a way to work the phrase binder full of women into this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I covered that this morning for you, Jesse. <laughs> but I'll see if anybody else can but do it. buy the t-shirt. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I guess if anyone wants to join the, the conversation. Well, Katie Couric has nothing on you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Somebody is talking about confidence. I find, I'm a litigator, and I find that some of the most successful litigators are, particularly the men, are clinical narcissists. I mean, that they really have this <laughs> overconfidence that can be amazing in the courtroom, mm -hmm. but is horrible mm -hmm. at assessing risk. Mm -hmm. and horrible at assessing when they should be settling cases and when they should be negotiating. And that is where I actually think where this overconfidence, so I can't speak to all the other business places, but I can certainly say in litigation, it has people spend a hell of a lot of money on things that aren't mm -hmm. worth it mm -hmm. and that are, are, are wasteful, not only in time, but also in, in money over, over time, like time of your people's time in that litigation. So that confidence can also, I mean, they can talk themselves into anything. This is some great case, you've got this great witness, and you've got a bunch of dogs, I mean, they're awful, right. you know, and they're gonna do terrible in court. So I do think that there's, the overconfidence can be a bit much. And then they, even when they lose, they convince their clients. I mean, this, I've seen this. They convince their clients that they didn't actually lose. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, and so I tend to actually trust more an assessment by a female litigator about what the real strengths and weaknesses are than I will a male litigator. Yeah. I, I mean, I, so I, I've if had that's any experiences, to, we have a. Um, I, I should, is it anyone here from Lyle? Okay, so I'll tell a story. So um, there's, there's, I'm, I'm saying, there's a guy um, at Weill who is really one of the most um, prominent IP litigators in the world. Again, like I described Bill Lee, and um, he's been at the ITC, at the International Trade Commission, quite a bit. And the guy comes with an entourage. There's a black Escalade always with a guy who drives for him dressed in black, kind of a Calvin Klein model. And there's a black umbrella that comes out whenever there's a drop of rain. And this might all well go well in district court, but at the ITC, it's a little tiny place. There are four courtrooms and people are hanging around the hallways. And you know, he's a joke there. And I was actually happy, well not happy, but I mean, I, was, I, I wasn't surprised um, a few months ago when Wilde booted him. Um, and they did it after charges of sexual harassment. So I commend firm. And um, you know, that, it, to your point, it just doesn't, it doesn't play well in this world, um, that ego, that un, un, uh, unhinged ego. It just doesn't it work. It still works. I, I, well, I, I know there are a number of attorneys in town, and they have people who have skills on their feet. And even when they lose huge, I mean, multi million dollar cases, it is amazing what I hear back, sometimes from clients, even. And you know, sometimes sophisticated in house counsel that'll say, well, you know, we really, we could have lost so much more. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. 
yeah. there is something to that. Yeah. So sometimes it does help. Well, it, and I agree with you on the floor of the courtroom in front of a jury, that larger than life kind of view can um, be effective. But when you get to the hallway afterwards and you know, other general counsels are standing around and watching this. It's not something that I favor. But you know, I, I have long felt, um, having spent a lot of time in the big law firm, that the, you, you never want your litigator, I mean, the person who's literally going to go try the case, advise you on settlement. I mean, to me, yeah. the two, they, they're just, just two entirely happen. different yeah. skill sets. And, um, and I know that, you know, frequently the, the two jobs are merged into one, and I think that's a mistake. But it, it also strikes me that that's an argument for the diversity right there, right? It's to have yeah. those two right. personality two types and right pulling, you know, it, especially right. to the extent that they can really be equals in the game and both have the say um, right. about what happens yeah. next. Absolutely. And I just want one last thing, just to pause it, because you really got me thinking about the long hours and the night. And I think that emergency room docs, they work shifts, right? Somehow they're able to transition right. to actually saving people's lives. I have a theory on that, um, and I'll, I'll tell you what my theory is. In addition to the hours, you know, I just talked about the hours, but I think there's another dimension to it. The job is a very lonely job. And by lonely, I mean you're sitting there in front of your computer terminal, you know, for hour after hour after hour, crunching the model, you know, writing the book. And at the junior level, you know, there's very little, I mean, here are your emergency room, you're there, you're saving lives, you know, what great satisfaction. Here, you know, you're, there's, it's hard to find the satisfaction <laughs> in doing that because you don't even get to go to the meetings. I mean, we try to bring them where we can, but, um, you know, you, you can't, uh, sometimes they're not all that presentable. And so, uh, and sit in front of their computer all day, right? Especially after, you know, working the way they do, so. But I, I, I think that's, that's part of it. And um, I don't know. They do shift work. I mean, they're limited to yeah. 36 to 40 hours, right? I mean, I don't, uh, there's some that are actually limited. So you work 12-hour shifts, you work whatever, three 12-hour shifts, 13-hour shifts, and then you actually make money. Sometimes else you get less money. So I don't know if that would be possible in the You know, I'm sure it's possible. We don't do it, <laughs> but I'm sure it's possible. Well, people used to say that about being a lawyer. Exactly. Yeah. You have to do it when you're a lawyer. You have to yeah. work a yeah. billion yeah. hours, or you'll never learn how to be a lawyer. Well, you know, it, and so I, I, I wonder if it might not be possible. To sit well, and I remember at the beginning of my legal career, it was like that. You know, there was like Peggy's. You know, there was nothing that was too much to throw at the associates. You know, we just ruined this your weekend, morning. and it's five o'clock on Friday. Too bad. Um, now you can't do that in a law firm, but that really, you know, that phenomenon has not changed much in the investment bank. It's mm -hmm. still a rite of passage, and, mm -hmm. you know, your people are, have to be prepared to sacrifice their personal lives, at least for a while. I will say, too, that being married to a surgeon, what you've described has worked out very well in the ED, but it hasn't worked out in the OR. Mm -hmm. And women, mm -hmm. women's lives coming up in... Um, surgical residency and, and post-residency fellowship are hellacious. Mm -hmm. And I'm embarrassed by it. We, mm -hmm. My husband has a fellowship, and I've had to beg him every year to hire a woman. He's had the first woman in 15 years this year, and she's phenomenal, but she's a rare breed, and she's given up everything. Mm -hmm. And how much is that, though, cultural? It seems to me oh, yeah. the reason the law firms say that they are, and still right. continue, by the way, right. to have this, this notion that you don't work a certain amount of hours, you're less, you can have right. less, you're less of a person. Absolutely. It's not necessary. It's and I right. Don't think that it has anything to do with, and we also have this notion of real estate that, that we have to physically have these offices. And we, we recently had somebody come into the firm who's sort of the, the CEO of the firm now, and he's from an accountant background. And it's been fantastic because it's like, why do you have all this real estate? Mm -hmm. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. You work with computers for God's sake. All, all your research is done on computers and phones. You don't, people can work from home. And so he's really starting to change some of the thinking. Mm -hmm. I, 
down those preconceptions. I do. Um, i trying to think of some examples to share with you. There's definitely a different approach in the rainmaking um, dynamic. Um, and it, it's interesting. I would say that typically if I have a male-laden team coming and pitching for business, it's a lot of chest pounding and this is what I've done and this is what I've accomplished. And with women, it's more of a let me understand what you need. Um, this, these are the, this is the portfolio of skills that we can bring. It's more of a <coughs> bespoke approach to under, a give and take of understanding. I, I, I'm sorry to generalize like that, but I guess I, there's definitely a difference. And is one more productive than the four <laughs> it depends on the It depends on the situation. I mean, as I said, when you're going into a situation like bankruptcy, you want the biggest chest pounding, um, you know, the folks who are there who say, well, say, you're in crisis, we're going to save you. And we're going to go to, you know, all, all lengths to make sure that we save you. Um, so it, it depends on the situation, I guess. For me. I think it's very situa situational. We had another question over here. Did you? Yeah. My experience throughout my career to find best mentors have been men um, that, that were men and learned that he had to use showers. Um, what, I can't explain it, but that has just been the, <laughs> my experience. Um, would you have any insight seeing that you've never got this job? You know, does it, um, does it make me more sensitive to uh, issues that I may not be as sensitive to if I didn't? I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that the one thing I do know for sure is that my view of the opportunities available to women, as I saw them, you know, 35 years ago when I was in law school here, versus the way I see them today are totally different. I mean, I, I think my daughter, you know, she can do whatever she wants as long as, you know, she's willing to work hard and she has the guts um, that the world is available to her. And I don't think anybody thought that the world was, you know, available to women on equal footing 35 years ago. I mean, it was preposterous to think that, you know, it even was. I mean, just to be the young associate mm -hmm. at the law firm, that was trailblazing. I mean, forget about, you know, being the, the managing partner of a firm, unthinkable. You know, now, you know, none of that is unthinkable. So is it because, um, you know, I, I, I kind of see the world a little bit through her eyes? Maybe. But it, it's not something that I'm, I'm conscious of. I, I said this morning that I've, in male bosses, I seek those with, with daughters. Um, and that's worked out pretty well. I just think they do have a perspective and a sensitivity that's, that's valuable. Um, I actually have the relationships I've forged with those I've negotiated against um, in Japan particularly um, have been stronger where they've had daughters um, because the, those women are coming up in the world to a different world and they're appreciating that. It may not be um, a totally um, 
balanced world in Japan, but they know they're going outside the country and that in other environments, um, they hope that they will achieve equality and diversity and all of those things. So. Well, thank you all, Jesse, David, Laura. Thank you again for taking.